Jarek and Jody, why don't you guys come on up? You got an important announcement for us. Uh, and while you're coming up, I was supposed to intro a video, so I'm going to do that now. Uh, check out the screens. We got a little video to show you, and then we got a little announcement for you. Okay, so how many of you participated in that last year? There is a lot of people. It takes about 50 volunteers to be able to pull that off. Um, that is our Day for Hope. Um, that, as you can see, is going to be July 17th. This is going to be the third year that we've done this. Um, and what this outreach does is it reaches most of these kids that we are reaching are homeless kids or the neediest of the needy in our community. So it is a really important outreach. What we do is we supply all of their back to school stuff. Um, so they will come in and they will get backpacks and those backpacks will be filled with all their school supplies. They will get an actual care bag that will have shampoo, conditioner, deodorant. A lot of these kids, like I said, are homeless so they don't have any access to any of this stuff. So it's really a huge thing for them. Um, so what we are doing, we've actually upped the number that we do. Uh, last year we did 112, I believe it was. This year we're going to up that to 125 kids we want to try to reach. Um, most of these, yeah, most of these kids are from Booker Elementary. That's where we've been pulling our kids from, um, just so that you know where they're coming from. It is approx well, it's not approximately, it is $100 a child to sponsor. So we need to partnership with you guys to make that happen. Um, and I, like I said, they will get gift cards. They get two gift cards so that they can get shoes for back to school. They can get clothing for back to school. So that kind of puts them on an even playing field. As you know, some kids can be mean and um, put other kids down for not having the best shoes or, you know, clothing that they feel is appropriate. So we want to kind of even that playing field for them and give them what they need to start school and feel confident and, um, get them in the right direction. It really is an awesome event. As you saw, we have a lot of fun doing it. It's not just rushed. We try to space it between the cars so that you have plenty of time to connect with the people. Um, these are beautiful families. We have been serving these families now for three years in a row, the same families. So we're building relationships with them, which is awesome. Um, we know a lot of them by name as they come through now. And then afterwards, we do a little celebration lunch. Um, Pam Stahl put that on last year for us, and um, we got to have a good spaghetti dinner. Thank you, Pam. Um, so that was awesome. We are doing, we're not going to do a full contact um, event. We are going to do a drive through one just like what you saw there. So those of you that are a little hesitant about coming into contact with people, it will just be through the cars. They're going to open their trunks. 
we will put the stuff in there and then they will just make a circle around the building. It will pro approximately three hours, we can get everybody in. So again, um, if we can get volunteers, that would be wonderful. You can go on, um, on the website, you can go on the church app, church center, and volunteer there. You can also go on there and there's a, a button that you can click to do donations. Um, again, it's $100 to sponsor a child. If you don't have the full $100, give what you can because somebody else may be able to match that so that we can get a full child in there. Um, so it takes a lot, of, um, a lot of us coming together to make this happen. In the back of your seat, you have your tithing envelopes. You can also fill that out and just mark on there that it's for Day for Hope and we'll make sure it gets where it needs to go. And if you do not, I know some of you do not like going onto the app or any computer stuff. So you can also call Haley, and don't overwhelm her though. <laughs> uh, you can call Haley and she will help direct you. She will get you signed up to volunteer. She will help take information to do donations. I just really want to encourage you guys to really step up this year and try to help in any way you can. Um, even those of you that are online that aren't comfortable coming back here in church, you can donate, um, you can pray. We need this event to be prayed up. So whatever you feel like you can help, just let us know. Um, we need help in several different ways. So even if you're thinking, you know what, I can't really do this and I can't do that, reach out to us because we'll find a spot for you that you can do, okay? I just real quick to get going, but I just want to encourage you all to step in with whatever part that looks like for you. Financial, pray, intercession, showing up and putting your hand in the plow. This is an opportunity to, for us to be the hands and feet of Jesus and really show a, a big presence for the Lord, for our community, to help these needy families and whatnot. And not only that, but it's fellowship with everyone. We had an amazing time. And we, I didn't hear one negative thing said about the whole thing. It was a really fun time of fellowship. So I just strongly encourage you to, to help in any part, whatever that looks like for you, just to go before the Lord and see what your part is in that. So thank you. Well, good morning. Everybody's doing good this morning. So uh, my name is Nathan Wicker. For those of you that don't know me, I'm one of the pastors here at FOB. Uh, if it's your first time, thank you for being here with us today. We hope that you feel just like family. I know that the first time my wife and I visited this place, it felt like home, it felt like family. So uh, I hope you feel like family this morning. We've been in a series called How to Grow for the last uh, couple weeks. Started on Mother's Day, and our Mother's Day panel um, talked about grace. And they showed us how important grace is in a life and what it looks like through different lenses, through different seasons of life. Um, one thing that we have to understand if we're going to grow as Christians, um, that the growth is going to happen over time, right? You're not just going to say, okay, Jesus, I follow you, and then boom! You're a rock star, right? Maybe not a rock star. That's not the right thing. Um, but we can't begin to grow unless we grasp the fact of the one that's causing the growth. Because if we don't understand who gives the growth, then we're just going to spin around doing everything that we can to make ourselves grow. It's when we humble ourselves and empty ourselves that God brings the growth. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 7 tells us that only God gives the growth doesn't say God gives some of the growth. It says only God gives the growth. And then last week, week number two, Pastor Chris talked to us about prayer and he challenged us. He had four awesome values that he pulled out of it. It was honesty, persistence, faith, and honor. And praying through those lenses and praying around those values. And it was, it was so awesome. I don't know about you guys, but I felt challenged in my prayer life this week to, to wrap my prayers around those things. And then this week, we're going to talk about fasting. And everyone started to fast right now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but Ecclesiastes 4.12 tells us that a three-chord strand is not easily broken. Thank you. And um, the three-chord strand. It says, and though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A three-fold three cord is not quickly broken. We've been taking this whole series out of Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, which is known as the Sermon on the Mount. And you'll notice there's three different things that Jesus says when you do these things. 
When a Christian does these things, it creates a threefold corded strand that will not be quickly or easily broken. And those three things were when you pray, when you fast, and when you give. Three somewhat hard things to do. Not necessarily three things that just come natural to everyone. I would say that all three really don't come natural to anyone right off the bat, right? Because I don't know about you, but I like to eat. So fasting kind of goes against that, you know? And I don't know about you, but I get kind of busy, and sometimes prayer can be kind of needy, and it's like, gimme, gimme, gimme. And I don't know about you, but I do like to give sometimes, but I also like to receive. So they're kind of a little different, right? But Jesus said, when you do these things, if you want to grow, you must have these three active in your life. All three of them. Not two, not one, not two and a half. All three need to be active in your life. So I want to share three testimonies right off the bat about my experience with fasting. The first time I ever fasted, I was 15 years old, and the church that I was attending went on a 21-day Daniel fast. Now, at the time, I would have said I was a Christian, But I would not have said that I was pursuing God or experiencing the fullness that God had for my life. In fact, I would say that I didn't even have a vision for my life. We did a 21-day fast, and I'll tell you how hard this is. My birthday is January 27th. We started the fast, I'm pretty sure, the 6th of January. So if that tells you anything, I didn't get to celebrate my birthday the way that I wanted to. We'll talk about a Daniel fast in a minute, but I can tell you birthday cake is not on that list. It was one month after that fast that I ended up at a youth conference. God drastically grabbed a hold of my life. I got filled with the Holy Spirit, and he gave me a vision for my life that I would be a voice for my generation. He revealed a lot of other things and actually confirmed some things that were prophesied over me when I was little. But that started, and I believe that birthed out of me emptying myself, going on a fast and saying, God, here is 21 days at the beginning of my year. Tell me what you want to do with me. I'm yours. The second fast I want to point out was for 10 days before I began dating my now wife, we went on a fast together. We fasted from each other, so we had no communication for 10 days. In the first seven days of that fast, I did a Daniel fast. In the last three days, I did nothing but water. I'll be honest with you. It was one of the hardest fasts I've ever done in my life, and I was really grumpy. (laughs) However... In that 10 days, God spoke to me so clearly the kind of husband that I was to be. He showed me that she was indeed my wife, and he showed me how to care for her. He knew, I knew at that moment, before we had even started dating, I knew she was going to be my wife. Why? Because I emptied myself. I cleared my mind. I said, God, what do you want from me? Because I really liked her. But if she wasn't going to be my wife, I wasn't wasting my time. Right? (laughs) The last fast that I want to point out was a seven-day fast that my wife and I did right before this job appeared on the radar. It was December of 2016, and her sister and brother-in-law are like our best friends. And I think I've told this before, but basically they challenged us and said, what are you guys doing? You guys are worth way more than this. You guys can do way more than this. You guys need to be serving the body, and you guys are being lazy. I was like, oh. <laughs> Love you, too. <laughs> so January rolls around, and I said, I don't, I don't know what we're supposed to do. <laughs> Let's just fast. So seven days, we start fasting, <laughs> which, ironically enough, the church I was at, we celebrate all the birthdays for that month, and we would all go out to a staff lunch. That seven days happened to be the staff lunch, and we went to Cracker Barrel, and I ate a salad. Um, And I was like, oh, and I love breakfast food. So if you know me, like, Cracker Barrel is like, come on, let's go. Let's order order all the breakfast, and I'm eating a salad. And I was just like, what is this world coming to? But that moment, the reason I bring that up is because as I left that lunch and I headed back to the church, my grandfather calls me out of nowhere. He says, I was walking this morning and praying, and you came to my mind. And at the time, I worked for a company you may have heard of called Apple. And he said, hey, there's an Apple store here in Sarasota. Would you mind transferring down? And he said, also, our church needs a youth pastor. As soon as he said that, 
I should back up even more because in, in December we said, God, we'll do anything you want, just not youth ministry. <laughs> so you can tell why we had to go on a fast. God had to get something out of us. As soon as he said, our church needs a youth pastor, what do you think happened? I started crying in my car, just started weeping. And I'm like, what is this? What is this, God? No, not the tears, not the tears. Did you hear what I said last month? I said, I don't even know how to respond to you right now. Let me just call my wife and see what she says. So I call my wife and I said, hey, I know we have a five-month-old. And um, I know we live 15 minutes from all of our family. But Papa just called me and blah, 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 blah. I said, what do you think? You know what? She didn't say no. (laughs) She could have easily just said, nope, that's not it. She didn't say no. The rest of the story is we ended up coming down here. We had three different opportunities that year to go three different places, directions. We felt like God put us here. I tell you those three because that's how important fasting is to me. Every big decision I've ever had to make in my life or every big turning point that's happened in my life has been a result of a fast. So on that note, would you guys stand with me this morning in honor of the reading of God's word? We're in Matthew chapter 6. Smack dab in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Beginning in verse 16, Jesus says, When you fast, do not look gloomy. I'm going to read it up there because that's not what I have here. And when you fast, I have NIV down here and it's ESV up there. And I don't like it when people read a different version that's on the screen. It's confusing to me. So, when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head with oil and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. That's the word of the Lord. That's right out of Jesus' mouth. You guys may be seated this morning. So let's talk about what is fasting. Also, did you guys get a handout this morning? There were handouts. They were on the communion table. So if you didn't get communion, that means you probably didn't get a handout, which means you're missing two important things for the service. Just going to throw that out there. If you feel like taking notes, I worked really hard to make these note sheets for you guys. But they're up here. I'm not going to be offended if you get up right now. I'm not going to judge you and be like, oh, they didn't get it when they walked in. But now would be a great time to grab your communion cup and grab notes. There's pens in the back of the seat. So the Lexham Bible Dictionary would define fasting as a ritual of abstaining from food and or drink for a predetermined period, practicing the Bible primarily as a means of mourning. I like this. This is good. This is good. Notes are good. Blessed are the note takers. They shall receive extra communion. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, grab a communion cup, grab two, take one. If your spouse didn't come up with you because they were embarrassed, grab one for them too. (laughs) This is awesome. I love today. Today has just been (laughs) awesome. Oh, cleaning it out. I think we also have communion in the back too. And there's gluten-free options. You guys think I'm kidding. (laughs) I'm not. I'm not. Oh, fantastic. Cool. All right, I'm going to go forward. So it's a ritual. So let's, let's talk about what a ritual is. A ritual is a solemn ceremony with actions done in order. A solemn ceremony with actions done in order. Here's what that means. Fasting is special. It's a solemn ceremony. If something is solemn, it's, it's set apart. It's, it's special. It's unique. It's that moment, and it's, it's got order. I like order. You too? Good. Yes, order. Where are my order people at? You like order, structure, task list. Yes, let's go. Yes. And I need a task list for the task list. We got to know that there's order to the order. Yes. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Now we know where all of the leaders that need to organize and administrate things are. Thank you. Thank you. But there's order to it. 
And there's been times when I've gone on a fast when I've just been like, oh, I'm just going to fast today. And there's no order or structure, so I'm like, oh, that cupcake looks really good. Oh, I'll just have one cupcake. God understands, right? But there's no order to it, so I really don't believe there was value. The second word I want to point out is abstaining. It means to restrain oneself from doing something particularly enjoyable. I like food. I like good food. I like tasty, good, gourmet food. Food is enjoyable. When you have someone over to your house, what do you generally do? You eat some food, right? When you get together and you celebrate, what do you do? You eat some food. Yeah. When you want to have a pie eating contest, what do you need? Food. Speaking of which, Adam Walker, where are you? You won the pie eating contest yesterday. And Alyssa Welty won the pie baking contest. So if you need pies eaten, you know where to go to. If you want to eat a tasty pie, you know where to go. Fantastic. But you need food. So fasting has order, but it also has reward. Fasting has order and reward. A history of fasting is up to this point when Jesus made this claim about how you're supposed to fast. Fasting had been related to mourning or hardship or purification. You would see nations fast before they went to battle. You would see people fasting if they were in repentance. You would see people go on a fast if they needed to go through a purification process. In fact, today, it's not even necessarily a spiritual thing, but there's a diet that's intermittent fasting. And it's a way that people lose weight. It's a way that people rid themselves of toxins. Hello, God designed it to be that way. And the world can take what God made and still reap the benefits because what God created is what it is. So a secular person can come in and say, hey, you should do this intermittent fasting thing, and the principles that God set in motion from the beginning are still going to stand because God is good. You would be able to identify if someone was fasting or going through a tough season because it would have been physical on them. They would have done this thing by wearing sackcloth and ashes. Maybe you've read that before in the Bible. They they began to mourn, and they put on sackcloth and ashes. This sackcloth would have been a cloth made of black goat's hair. So it would have been coarse, rough, thick. They would have used it to, they would have woven it together for like a sack for carrying food or money. It was like a burlap sack. I want you to think burlap. And they would put this on in their season of mourning. They would have also either marked their head or literally sat in a pile of ashes These ashes were the ashes of a red heifer in in regards to the purification process. They were the ashes of a red heifer burned entirely. And then they were sprinkled on the unclean, and through that they were made ceremonially clean. The interesting thing about that is in Hebrews 9.13, the writer of Hebrews points to Jesus being our purification sacrifice. The red heifer was to be without defect, no blemish. It was slaughtered for purification. Numbers 19, 4 through 5. I just had to read this so you guys get the understanding of what kind of ashes we're putting on ourselves here. Then Eliezer, the priest, is to take some of its blood on his finger and sprinkle it seven times toward the front of the tent of meaning. While he watches, the heifer is to be burned. It's hide, flesh, blood, and intestines. All burned. The whole thing. Lay the whole red heifer up there. Burn it, take the ashes, and then you were either marking your head with them or you were literally sitting in a pile of ashes. That is what fasting was like. Aren't you glad we don't have to do that anymore? Sometimes we look at what Jesus said here and we're like, ah, I don't know. I don't know if I want to fast. I mean, giving up food for a few days, for, for seven days, 21 days, and I can't eat meat? What? That's ridiculous. 40 days, when you start to realize the beauty of fasting, it's going to be something that you do regularly. So point number two, how do we fast? Number one, do it regularly. Don't just do it once a year. Don't just do it when a big situation comes up in your life, but I encourage you to do it regularly. Don't get legalistic about it and be like, oh, it's almost the end of the month. I didn't do my fast. I got to do my fast. Don't, don't get tied up in things like that, but you do it regularly. 
you know, just like you brush your teeth and take a shower and hopefully change your clothes every day. Um, you do certain things regularly that matter. Fasting is one of those things that you should do regularly. Matthew 6.16, 6, when you fast, do not look somber like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Jesus said, when you fast. That doesn't make it optional. I'll say that one more time. It doesn't make it optional. If you call yourself a Christ follower, a Christian, fasting should be a part of your life. All three of those, as I mentioned earlier, are all not optional. When you pray, when you give, when you fast. Second thing is you need to fix your motive. Fix your motive. He says, do not look somber. You see, back in the day when you would fast, you would look somber. It was a part of the ritual. People could tell that you were going through a hard time. The mourners would be there. You're wearing itchy burlap sackcloth. You smell horrible. You're sitting in ashes. It's just painful. But Jesus is here saying, don't look somber. Fasting was a form of mourning and purification, and you would wear that garment, and it would be obvious. He says, as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. Jesus is rewriting the structure of fasting. Why? Why? Why would he step on the scene and rewrite the, season, the, the structure of fasting? I'll tell you why. Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. Now, first of all, Isaiah 61 is a messianic prophecy chapter, which means it's pointing to the promised Messiah that the Jews would have been waiting for. Isaiah 61 is also the chapter that Jesus read when he started his ministry, when he went in the, the synagogue and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me. When he starts reading that, it was very significant because when he gets done reading it, he says, today this prophecy has been fulfilled. He read that in Nazareth, his hometown, and shortly thereafter, they rallied around him and kicked him out of his own town. They didn't even believe him. And yet all the prophecies that had pointed to him, so here's what he says. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor in the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who, what? Okay. Provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of what? And give the oil of joy instead of, in a garment of what? Instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for display of his splendor. Why is that significant? Some of you already got it, and you're like, this is awesome. You could come up here, and you could preach this right here. But I'm the one preaching today. <laughs> Notice what happened here. No longer is fasting solely related to sackcloth and ashes because the Messiah has stepped on the scene, and everything changes when the Messiah steps on the scene. There's no reason to mourn. There's no reason to grieve. There's no reason to do these things because the Messiah has stepped on the scene. And he says, this passage has been fulfilled today. When Jesus stepped on the scene and made this happen, it says that your ashes, the purification, has now become what? Beauty. So there's no longer a reason for you to sit in ashes and go through that because Jesus has come the sackcloth, which represented mourning, has now been replaced with not a garment of sackcloth, but a garment of praise. And Jesus specifically says here, when you fast, put oil on your head. What is the oil here? It's the oil of gladness. When Jesus steps on the scene, he completely restructures the way that fasting is. Because when Jesus stepped on the scene, when he died and the veil was torn intimacy was able to happen now for everyone, not just one guy one time a year to go in and offer the sacrifice, but every single one of us that would say Jesus is Lord is now having an opportunity to step into intimacy with him. So Jesus is rewriting everything we know about fasting. Third thing is we need to make it intimate. Verse 18, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. 
If you look at these three things, giving, praying, fasting, notice at the end of every single one of them, Jesus says, and your father who sees you in secret will reward you. Yes, there's times that we pray corporately, and that's awesome, but you should be praying more privately than you are corporately. And yeah, there might be a time that we do a corporate fast, but you should be fasting more privately than you are corporately. And yes, there is time of corporate giving, and we'll talk about that next week, but you should be giving more in private than you are in public because it's intimate. When you fast, you're connecting to the heart of God. And if you're intimate with someone, they can whisper to you. And they might just tell you something that they haven't told everyone else. They might deliver a word to you. God might speak something to you that he hasn't told the whole group yet. He might give you a little picture of what's to come. He might give you a little direction of how to pray, of how to give. When you are intimate with the Father, he will reveal things to you that he doesn't reveal to everyone else. Fasting is not about moving the hand of God, but it's about connecting to the heart of God. Because when you're connected to the heart of God, his hands will move. But if your only motive to fast, if your only motive to give, if your only motive to pray is to, God, I just need you to move your hand here. God, I'm praying and I'm believing for a miracle. I just need you to move. God, I feel like garbage today. I just need you to move. If that's your only prayer lifestyle, if your fasting is only, God, I just need this house. I need this house. I need this car. I need this car. And you're like, I'm going to go on a fast and I believe you're going to give it to me. If that's your only motive, you're missing the picture. The motive is to connect to the heart of God. Number three, let's talk about some fasts in the Bible. A common one is a 40-day fast. Some of you are already like, nope. I'll do everything else, but 40 days is too long. 40 days. Let me tell you the significance of 40 days, and then maybe you're going to be like, I'm doing a 40-day fast. 40 days. 40 days represents a cleansing period. 40 days of rain during the flood when God had to cleanse the earth. Moses' life is divided into three sets of 40. 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the wilderness, 40, year, or 40 years in Egypt, then he, 40 years in the wilderness. Guys, I'm messing this up. Yes, wilderness at his father-in-law's, then he came back and delivered them, and then they were in the wilderness for 40 more years, which the last 40 was not really his fault, but eh, happens. Jonah goes to Nineveh, and he gives them 40 days to get right with God. Elijah fasted for 40 days after defeating the prophets of Baal. Jezebel's like, I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to make you like one of them. Elijah runs off into the wilderness, and for 40 days he fasts, and he goes and he meets God. And in that moment, what is happening? God whispers to him. He wasn't in the fire. He wasn't in the earthquake. He wasn't in the wind. He was in the whisper because it was intimate. And he gives Elijah direction for the next generation that's to come. Go back and anoint these two guys to be king and anoint your, predece your uh, predecessor? Successor. Successor. Words are hard this morning, guys. Jesus fasted for 40 days at the beginning of his ministry. And one thing I'll note about Jesus' fast is that the Holy Spirit led him into that fast. Jesus gets baptized and immediately goes in to the wilderness, and he fasts for 40 days right before he begins his ministry. And this is something, after reading this, I would actually suggest this for anyone that's a new believer, that you take 40 days and you fast. Right after you've said yes to Jesus, right after you've been baptized, you take 40 days and you fast. And I'm not saying do a total fast. We'll talk about the types of fast in a second. But get rid of some stuff. There's a cleansing period that you're going to need. So 40 days. I love this. In Ecclesiastes 10 verse 1, it says, Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench. So a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. That first part, dead flies in the oil, gives off a stench. Throughout the Bible, you see flies referenced as the devil, as the enemy. And what Solomon is saying here is the dead flies would come in and they would die in the anointing oil. They would spoil the anointing and they would give off a stench when God's looking for a aroma. Flies represent the devil. Does anyone want to take a guess as to how many days the life cycle is of a fly? 40 days. 
40 days. When farmers have to spray pesticides and they're trying to get rid of something, 40 days. 40 days. When you give up and abstain for 40 days, it is going to kill even the littlest flies, even the littlest gnats in your life, those little things that only pop up every once in a while. Man, I'll tell you what, there's a gnat in my house right now and it's driving me crazy because it only pops out for about three minutes a day and then he disappears and I cannot get him. I cannot. And it's annoying. Is he doing anything wrong in my house? I don't know. But he's just annoying. He's a nuisance. And how many things in our life are we allowing to sit there and fly around and be a nuisance? Go on a 40-day fast. Watch yourself be delivered from that fly. Kill the gnats in your life. So that's a 40-day fast. The second one I want to point out is a Daniel fast. We see that two times in the book of Daniel, Daniel and his friends fasted. The first one was for 10 days, and that's when they had just been taken into Babylon. They're captive, and they did not want to eat the king's royal food because there was unclean food in there. So they make a wager with the authorities. They said, listen, for 10 days, we're just going to eat fruits and vegetables and drink water. You can feed all the other young guys whatever you want to feed them, and let's just see how they measure up at the end of 10 days. So at the end of 10 days, they come together and Daniel and his friends looked more healthy than any of the other young men that ate the royal food. How can that be? And no, I'm not pushing for a plant-based diet. All of you that love meat, I love meat, okay? I'm not pushing for a plant-based diet here. But you see that there was something significant in that moment. Later on in Daniel, you see that he fasted for 21 days, eating only, again, fruits, vegetables, and water. When he did that, It was because he had petitioned prayers to heaven and had not heard a response back from God. So he goes on a fast for 21 days, and at the end of 21 days, Michael shows up, the archangel Michael, big Michael. And he shows up, and he says, I just want to encourage you, Daniel. We heard your prayers from the moment you prayed them. The spiritual warfare to get me here to deliver this message was so intense. We've been fighting For 21 days. For 21 days. Daniel's prayer had already been answered, but his fasting, his fasting, I believe, empowered those angels even more to deliver that message. There is a special thing about emptying yourself of yourself because if Daniel would not have done that, he could have easily been like, well, God doesn't care about me could have gotten self-seeking. Well, I cried out, God, you've answered me before. Why not this time? Why have you forsaken me? But because he was fasting, he was patiently waiting. And at the end of 21 days, his answer shows up. Some other fasts that we see through the Bible, Saul had fasted for three days after encountering Jesus and his whole life is changed and his name is then changed to Paul. Cornelius fasted for four days when he was seeking God. He sent for Peter and the gospel was brought now to the Gentiles. Jews fasted for Esther. Esther said, hey, I want you to go proclaim a fast for the Jews because I got to go in and talk to the king. And the Jews fasted for Esther. Israel fasted when the tribe of Benjamin had turned on the rest of the, of the country. And I want to say this about that. That one right there speaks to me. If you've got some family issues going on, go on a fast. If there's nothing your family can agree on, tell everyone to go on a fast. Hey, seven days. Let's all just go on a fast together. Someone brings some order to it. Hey, we're all going to do a Daniel fast, fruits, vegetables, and water. Let's go. Seven days. Let's regather in a week. Tell us what the Lord has said. You watch your struggling marriage turn around in that moment. You watch your lost child. If he's going on a fast with you, you watch him start to soften his heart and come around. You watch your crazy aunt or uncle not be as crazy anymore. When you start to petition for things, because the tribe of Benjamin had lost their ever-loving minds. They were killing each other. Civil war. So the other 11 tribes come together. They proclaim a fast. They went through and they defeated them. Brought order back to the family. Jehoshaphat proclaims a fast in the country as the enemy sends threat. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 2 through 4, some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already as Hazon Tamar, that is, En Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. That's a great idea. And he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. 
The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. And when you fast forward, let's see what happens in verse 22. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and the Moabites rose up against the man from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. They started fighting against each other. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. You can't make this stuff up. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked at the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. They didn't even have to lift a finger. The whole country goes into a fast, and what happens? Your enemies are wiped out. Are you guys seeing how powerful fasting is? So point number four, it's time to take action. Number one, determine why are you fasting? As I mentioned before, I've gone through several different fasts in my life, but the three that I mentioned before, the first one was just uh, my church was going, and I was like, cool, let's be in the cool crowd. Everyone's fasting. Let's do it, you know? And maybe that's how you got to try it. Maybe you just got to grab a friend and be like, hey, let's be trendsetters. Let's go fast. Let's fast. Start for three days. Start for one day. Start easy. But know your why and target your prayers. If you're not praying while you're fasting, it's just a diet. Or you're starving yourself. Prayer has to go into it, as well as reading the word. Second thing is choose a fast. Now, if you feel ever so bold, you can go on a full fast, which means you're abstaining from everything. Or maybe you just add water in there. Highly would recommend, depending on how long you're going to do it, if you don't know your body, consult a doctor. And that's okay. You're not going to avoid Matthew 6 if you go and tell your doctor, hey, I'm planning on fasting. God's not going to be like, oh, you told someone. It's out in the open. It doesn't count anymore. No. Consult a doctor because you don't want to end up in the hospital in a bed because you didn't consult a doctor. And you're like, God, I'm starving myself for you. No, you don't want to do that. Partial fast would be one that I could recommend anyone and everyone do. So partial fast means you're just abstaining from partial food groups, right? So you have a Daniel fast. I think I put a, a website on your handout, ultimatedanielfast.com. And there's just some great ideas on there. It's a, if you need structure, there's a list of foods that you can and can't eat if you need structure. I like to just say a Daniel fast, just eat fruits, vegetables, and water. Super easy. But if you're looking for maybe more specific things, that can give you help. And it can also give you some recipes. Um, you could do a juice fast. Make yourself a smoothie. Only drink juice. No food. Uh, you could do a no meat fast. For those of you that love meat, I highly recommend this one for you. Because, again, fasting is getting rid of something that you enjoy. No meat fast. You could do a no bread fast. Are there any bread lovers in here? Yes. Mm. I love when I go to a restaurant and it's just endless bread. That's just, it's just like heaven, man. Um, or no sweets. Anybody have a sweet tooth in here? I've got a mouthful of sweet teeth, so <laughs> I'm with you. But you can get rid of those things. And then the third thing is you need to choose a time because we're bringing structure and order to it. So as I've mentioned before, there's 40 days. You could do 21 days. You could do 10 days. You could do seven days. You could do five days, three days, one day. Start somewhere. I would recommend this week, start with a one day. If you already live a lifestyle of fasting, stretch yourself a little bit. If you always do a five-day fast or always do a three-day fast, go a little bit longer this time. Stretch yourself a little bit more. You could also fast by meal frequency. You could say for the next 21 days, I'm only going to eat dinner. Or you could do a timed fast where you say, while the sun is up, I'm not going to eat. You only eat when the sun goes down. For those of you that are not early risers, probably means you're going to be missing breakfast. <laughs> The next thing that I would say is you have to, while you're fasting, eat the bread of life. I cannot tell you how many times I've been on a fast, and I will generally try to replace that meal time with word time. And if you think about it, a meal generally lasts about 30, 45, maybe 60 minutes. If you took that time, how much of God's word could you read? And if you have three meals a day, oh my goodness! 
you would read so much. I can't tell you. This is just a testimony of how God's goodness in Bible and all of it works. I can't tell you how many times I've been on a fast, whipped open my Bible, read for 20 minutes, wasn't hungry anymore. Literally, my stomach would be gurgling, gurgling. I would sit down and read for 20 minutes, get up, totally filled. Well, that's crazy. I know. Newsflash, kingdom of heaven doesn't make sense in the kingdom of earth. In John 6, 48, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You see Jesus when he meets the woman at the well in John chapter 4. The disciples come back and it says, Rabbi, eat. He said to them, I have food that, to eat that you don't know about. The disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. You see Jesus sitting in this moment where it's hot, it's the middle of the day, you know he's hungry, he sent the disciples away, which I think he just sent them away because he was tired of hearing them whining. So they go and get some food, they get their bellies full. He comes back, he's just done the will of his father, he's met this woman, and he said, I'm not even hungry anymore. The father fed me. I have a food that you don't even know about. Interesting, right before Jesus talks about fasting, he's listing these things called the Beatitudes, and he says, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Another cool advice tip that I would give you is give your meals away. If you would normally grab a coffee in the morning, give it to someone else. If you would normally go out to eat or pack a lunch, pack it and give it to someone else. Give your dinners away. While you're fasting, give. And pray, because it's a three-corded strand. When you begin to do that, I am telling you, you will unlock the power of God in your life. You will begin to hear him clearly. You will begin to see things. So here's some practical advice for you. Be proactive. When you're on a fast, don't sit there and sulk and be like, oh, I can't eat. I'm just going to scroll on social media. I'm just going to go watch Netflix. Don't do that. Take your meal times and be proactive with them. Go do something. Read your word. Drink lots of water. If you're doing a fast and you're getting rid of all the other drinks and you're just doing water, drink lots of it, like a gallon a day. Like excessive water. Because here's why. The benefits of that, it's going to, again, purify you. It's going to release all the toxins. I'm telling you. There's been so many times when I've gone on on a fast, and at the end of it, I feel so great. This is sound weird, but I feel like my skin feels better. And then as soon as I eat some fast food, I, like, start popping zits out, weird plate. I'm like, what is going on here? It's because the toxins were gone. I know that sounds funny, but that's literally the practical side of it. This is the way that God designed it. That when you fast, there's just so many benefits to it. If you're going to drink lots of water, drink purified water. Tap water has toxins in it. Plain and simple. So don't try to flush out the toxins with more toxins. It's not going to work. Third thing I would say practically, speaking from experience, don't gorge yourself right before you fast. Don't go or after. (laughs) I've been on both sides, and it's not fun. It is not. Don't go to the all-you-can-eat buffet the night before you start your fast, okay? Okay. Don't, don't do it. You will regret it, I promise you. Again, I've been there multiple times, made the mistake multiple times. Don't do it. Don't do it. As we close today, you guys have elements of communion. I find it interesting that we're going to take the Lord's Supper on a day we talk about fasting. But maybe it's not so interesting. Also, before you open it, make sure the bread is up. Don't open the juice side first. But if you can take this. In Matthew 26, it says, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he said to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. 
So I was reading a book this week. It's uh, called Fasting by Jensen Franklin. Highly recommend it. You could read it in like a week. It's a quick read. Lots of good stuff in there. I pulled some things today out of there. The flies thing, that was from that book. He pointed something out that when Jesus says, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom, that Jesus is fasting for us. That as we take this today, we're going to remember him and we're going to remember his broken body. We're going to remember his blood that was poured out for us and know that he's fasting, that he's abstaining, that he's waiting for the day when he can come and collect his bride. He is believing so strongly for us. He is fighting. He is contending for us. So as we take this, this moment, I want you to take that with that in mind. If you'd hold the bread up. Father, we thank you that you sent your son as the ultimate sacrifice. God, I thank you that we don't have to put on sackcloth or sit in ashes any longer, Lord, that you've given us beauty, that you've given us a garment of praise, Lord, that you've poured the oil of gladness on our head because you sent your son. Jesus, I thank you for your sacrifice. You gave your life for us. How hard is it for us to abstain from a meal or two? So we thank you for your broken body. Let's partake this morning. As we lift up the cup, it represents his blood that was poured out for us. It's a blood that washes away every sin, every stain, every wrong thing you've ever done, wrong thought you've ever thought. Even all the times that you broke your fast, all the times you forgot to pray, the times that you haven't given, the blood washes it all away. So Lord, we thank you for the blood, for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, I pray that your blood would just wash us anew, God, that we would step into that and realize that we are truly cleansed by your blood. You purified us once and for all, God. And we thank you for that. Let's partake. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters this morning. God, would you just pour out your blessing on them over every household, under the sound of my voice, for every person watching online. God, I pray that your spirit would just inhabit them, inhabit their homes. Lord, would you rest on them? Father, I pray that as we as a collective body begin to explore this idea of fasting and implementing it regularly in our life, God, would you just begin to blow our minds with what you want to do with FOB in Sarasota? God, as we begin to rid ourselves of ourselves, would you begin to show us the plans that you have, Lord? Would you begin to show us the ways that you want to go about doing things? Father, we are in your hand. Come and do with us what you want to do. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Well, let me just make sure. Don't have any closing announcements. Last thing I want to tell you guys to do is pick a fast and do it this week. You don't have to start today. That would just be mean and cruel of me. But pick a fast this week. Maybe you start with one day. Maybe you decide, you know what, Monday, I'm, I'm going to give you Monday, Lord. I'm not going to eat anything. I'm just going to drink water. Also, if you do peppermint oil, that helps settle the belly. Just a little trick. Maybe you pick three days. Maybe you say, you know what, I'm going to fast for the rest of the month to the end of May. We'll even for strong June. Maybe you're struggling at home and there's just some fighting back and forth and it's just tense and just... We don't know what to do. We're praying, we're praying, we're praying. Well, there's two other things. So go on a fast. Begin to give this week. Give of yourselves. Give something away. Go on a fast this week.
but God so desperately wants to move. He's just looking for someone that will say, here I am. Empty yourself so he can pour his oil in and fill you up. Amen. God bless you guys this morning. You guys are formally dismissed. We're going to have the prayer team up here if you guys need prayer. So I want to invite you guys up here if you need prayer this morning. Uh, but other than that, that is your dismissal this morning. Thank you guys. God bless you. High five someone on your way out. Testify of God's goodness. And we will see you guys next week.